Welcome back. In case you're just joining us, so still COVID-19 watch. This is the Money Line with Nancy segment where we take you through the economics of the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining me right now on Skype via, from Lagos is Dr. Franklin Ungu. Uh, he's an associate professor as well as an economist with the Lagos Business School. Uh, Dr. Ungu, thanks for joining me today. Hope you're keeping safe. Hi, it's Lagos. Yep. Good morning, Nancy. Yes, we are in isolation and we are keeping safe and hoping for the best. Now, since you said we are hoping for the best, let me ask you the first question. Do you think that we are in control of uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria? Do you think we are in control and have we gone ahead of the infection? Two questions, two bullets. Are we in control <laughs> with what we're doing now? <laughs> if we are in control, have we gone ahead of it or are we not in control? Well, the virus is still ahead of us. I think it's, um, it's too early to say that we are in control of the virus and uh, because of the way things are going. However, the federal government is doing a lot in terms of trying to do their best. But of course, a lot can be done from the states, across the, uh, across the states and even local governments. The private sector has also contributed enormously, is quite is, which is very commendable. So in terms of if, we are, if we've gone ahead, it's also too early to say that we've gone ahead of the virus, given how it uh, spreads and given the way it's, before you know it, it becomes ex exponential. And because we are now seeing um, uh, community um, infections going on. So I think that it is too early to say, but of course what the government is doing uh, is commendable, but can be improved upon. Now my question, I really did not mean uh, because I'm getting these answers now very frequently. It's too early to say. It's too early to say. And I, I, I don't want to agree. My question is, are we going ahead of the infection? Are we exerting control over the infection as a result of some of our actions? That's what I'm saying. As a result of these lockdowns, as a result of what we're seeing that the NCDC is doing, for example, are we going ahead of the virus to contain do you understand what I'm saying? Because with what you said, if we're seeing community spread, one would just infer, we just infer with my scientific mind that we are not in control. Or, or we are just being a bit political with our answer. And we don't need to be political with our answers right now. No, it's not, it's not about being political with our answers. Of course, the, the person or the people who should give a, a specific opinion or a specific view about if we are uh, in control, is should be a uh, public health experts like the uh, ncdc director general however what i'm trying to say is that what the government is doing they are trying but a lot has to be done there are still issues in terms even the lockdown even in terms of the palliatives we also need to appreciate that covid 19 is primarily a health challenge but it's also it has also so many other uh, issues with regards to the economics the social issues and all that. So if, when we say if we are in control, we cannot say that we are in control. And as I said, it's too early to say that we are really in control because of the way things are going. So in terms of the spread, it's still increasing. So we are not in control. In terms of the lockdown, it's not really very, very effective across even in Lagos um, and what I've heard like uh, Abuja or Ogun, as the case may be. So we are not really, it's not really very effective. In terms of communication, in terms of awareness, we are still not in community because many people are still even doubting if we have coronavirus. So it's a challenge. So I have people, I mean, people, so I call a mechanic and say, come and do something for me. And he told me, I said, are you aware that there's coronavirus? He said, there's nothing like coronavirus, that it's only for people that believe that it's coronavirus. So in terms of awareness and communication, many people are still not believing, people are still traveling. And across the states in Nigeria, it doesn't seem that our states or our state governors are clearly doing what they're supposed to do to enhance awareness, communication, effective control, and effective leadership to ensure that we really take control of the coronavirus. You know, it's, it's really, I wouldn't say surprising, though, with what you said, asking the mechanic if he's aware that there is COVID-19, and he said he's not aware. So I'm just uh, trying to ask myself, is it for those that are in the communication sphere, we are not doing enough? Or just like you said, the governors who are the closest to their uh, communities, 
are not doing enough because if you see TV, radio, so far, newspapers, all the stuff we've been doing is on COVID-19. So where is that lapse coming from? Or is it that our people are just being recalcitrant to the issue of coronavirus? Um, a lot of factors coming. Of course, you know, when we say we're on television, radio, uh, Twitter, internet, and all that and all that, the question is, what percentage of Nigerians are on these platforms? And so what I'm trying to say is that there is need for a more concerted effort to include all the different stakeholders, including traditional rulers, religious leaders, and all community leaders, to really, first of all, educate and explain to them the seriousness of coronavirus. So that when they now go back to their respective uh, communities, they will actually be, be uh, communicate and explain to the people. And on top of that, some of our leaders have not really exhibited that seriousness required for people to believe that there is coronavirus. So that's another challenge. So a situation where some pastors will still be willing and arguing that they want to um, uh, hold uh, uh, service in their, in, their, in their churches. Some imams will still be doing the same thing. Some of our governors are not really exhibiting what they're supposed to do, are not what they're supposed to exhibit. And even some of our educated elites, they question certain things. So all these factors come into the, and also because of issues with regards to trust, with regards to government. So people, of course, you know, there's a low, trust level with regards to government activities in Nigeria. So all these factors uh, come to come to come into to the, the issue that making people not to really believe or people making affecting our communication and understanding about the seriousness of coronavirus. Uh, doctor, let me prick your mind as regarding this lockdown and what you think. I know you've talked about uh, the need for a national lockdown. Uh, your um, newspaper article uh, also canvassed for it. But are you of the view that the lockdowns need to be localized? I, uh, the lockdown needs to be localized, but there's also a need to rethink what we are doing. What I was conversing is that I noticed that people, we said that Lagos is on lockdown. But I know a few people that said, okay, Lagos is on lockdown, let's go to Ibadan, because Ibadan is not on lockdown. So they moved to Ibadan. I know people that traveled all the way from Lagos to KB State, and even though there is a lockdown. So the question, and if you look at the transmission, the way it has moved to Castina, Kano, Anambra, and other states, you find out that all these transmissions are clearly from people that pass through Lagos and Abuja. So if we are saying that we are doing localized lockdowns, is it really effective? What I'm trying to say is that if we agree that lockdown is one of the strategies to curtail coronavirus, then it has to be effective, it has to be properly organized, and also to ensure that people are actually comply with regards to the palliative and support and all. So it, it, it looks like when you ask a governor, the person will say, oh, we have to put every, every, everyone on lockdown. But they've not really thought, thought it through to say, how do we ensure that this lockdown is working, or how do we ensure that this lockdown will not work? So a situation where a place is locked down, another place is, is open, a situation where some governors will say, okay, let's re relax the restrictions, let people go out for two days or three days, and we'll now return back to lockdown, I'm not sure they are effective. Now, what does an organized lockdown look like? Because it seems that what we're having right now, we're having a lockdown, but it's not organized. And a lot of people are still having their way one way or the other, as it were. What does an organized lockdown look like? And how should it be done? You understand what I mean, doctor, because I understand what you mean, but of course, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in public health. So I'm an economist and I teach strategy and risk management. So from that perspective, as a, as a lay person, I think that if, if we want to do a lockdown, then we should, it should be properly uh, taught through in terms of what we make people to actually agree to stay in their houses and in their homes. So now I'm talking about the palliatives. If you, you notice, the issues with regards to palliatives has really generated a lot of controversy, a lot of issues and all that. So I'm not, even though I'm not the expert, but from a layman point of view, I think that a lockdown should be a situation where there is little movement on the road, where the people that will be allowed to move are people with um, essential services, 
for people on emergency cases and all that. But however, for, for that to be to happen, we also need to be sure that people have been properly educated and also supported to agree to the lockdown. So it's not just they say lockdown everywhere and we lock down everywhere. So if that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it should be properly organized, uh, thought through, and ensure that people... So for instance, now, look at what is going on in Oshun State. Remember that Oyo is not really on lockdown. So you must pass a battle before you go to before you go to uh, Oshobo, as the case may be. So if you're passing through a battle, and people from Oshobo are, can clearly go, go to it, but it means that the infection can continue. That's what I'm trying to explain. Yeah, I know that you are not a health practitioner, doctor. But why I asked that question was because that in terms of organized lockdown is because you're seeing that most of those movements are based on, if not emergency cases, they are based on people going out to look for their daily bread. They are based on frustrations that they can't continue to stay at home since they've not been infected with coronavirus. They've been infected with hunger virus first and they don't want to die. That was why I actually asked you that question. But let's move ahead now to the areas that which you've raised concerns regarding what our state governors are doing. You've mentioned them like two or three times in your, in your opening remarks. Um, just speak to me about what we're seeing. We saw the Northern Governors Forum come up to say <laughs> that they need a special fund first and uh, that, you know, they are looking at this issue of lockdown. They are not looking at it with all seriousness. Is it baffling to you that people that should lead us are the ones saying, I really do not understand? Yeah, I, I sincerely, when I read, or observe, or listen to what our governors are, are doing, some of them are trying, but majority of them can do a lot better. And with regards to the Northern Governors Forum, and or even other governors from other regions, it's, it's quite disturbing in the sense that there is a perception that some of the governors are more interested in what is being shared with regards to coronavirus, not really about the effectiveness of what the measures that are putting through. I've also argued that it is time for, we, are, we expect that while the federal government is having, a, having teams in terms of COVID-19, the economic team for COVID-19, it's also important that some state, the state governors come down and say, let's really think properly in terms of the socioeconomic and health impact of COVID-19 on our respective states, either individually or regional basis. We are not seeing that. So if you look at what governors, Northern Governors Forum did, they are just setting up a committee that will look into these issues. This committee should have been there one month ago, two months ago, when we heard about coronavirus. If you look across the states, some of the states are still setting up uh, isolation centers. It shouldn't be like that. They should have set this up all this while. And the situation where they are now saying, oh, we've already spent so much money and we now need money from the federal government, it, is, it shouldn't be like that. So there should be more proactiveness or what I call responsible leadership and shared responsibility uh, uh, from our governors and other leaders of, of the society as well. Do you, do you think that perhaps the governors also have uh, a reason uh, to say that their states should adopt measures that are suitable to their setting, especially the northern region that uh, is so much engaged in farming and agriculture. So don't you see perhaps sense in what they're also saying that uh, each state should adopt measures suitable uh, to them, uh, stressing that perhaps a total lockdown of the region will come at a very high cost since most of them are farmers and we need to go back to the farms as the rains have started. You're smiling. <laughs> Why I'm smiling that there is no doubt that the lockdown should be contextualized, it should be, um, as I said before, thought through. However, it's also very important that we appreciate that if the virus spreads, there will be no famine. Nobody will go to any farm, people will be dying, people will be at home, people, and so even the agriculture we're talking about will not really proceed. So what we are supposed to say, we are not, nobody is saying that the lockdown should be for, for eternity. No, we are saying that it should, the lockdown, you know, normally what other people do is to say, okay, let's do it for 14 days and see how it goes, like for what happened in Lagos or Guna and Abuja, and it may be extended. The farming period really starts uh, from next month, June and all that. So if we say, if we have done this, 
and we properly isolate people that are infected and reduce the distance. And of course, as well, agriculture can still go on if it's properly organized. So most of the what we require is not really that you have 20 people farming at the same place. So one person or two or three people with tractor can go for farming. So the excuse that people must go for farming is not really very valid. That that's the reason why they should not lock down. Because people, you can still do one or two activities even with an organized lockdown. Okay, still, still sticking with this Northern Governors Forum uh, that came up with their yeah, statement calling, they call for definitely a, co a coordinated uh, response to tackle COVID-19. They also did say, which you mentioned, I want us to, to go back to that aspect, that the federal government uh, has not given the region anything, no money special attention not given to them, special allocation. We've seen what happened to Lagos. The federal government gave Lagos 10 billion naira. So they're also seeking for that kind of benefit. Let me put it that way. So it's like <laughs> what you said. So is it perhaps is also being deliberate on their part? Because some people are of that school of thought that uh, let them allow coronavirus into their state so that they would have a reason to collect money from the federal government. How? Um, uh, nobody is doubting or questioning that if, if the federal government can give them money, nobody is saying that they shouldn't give them money. The federal government gave Lagos 10 billion. It's because that Lagos is the epicenter of coronavirus. So if there is money, of course, the federal government will not um, stop or will not say that we will not give money to, to the northern states. But it is also disappointing and disturbing that the governors will be arguing that they need money from the federal government for them to actually do what they're supposed to do. Each state in Nigeria is more or less, we rather we run a federal system. So they're supposed to, they have a budget for health, for epidemics like this, and for emergencies like this. So are they saying that there is no money in their states to actually address this? Must it be that the federal government must provide money for them to do this? That's why I say that there is need for responsible leadership and shared responsibility. If there is money to be shared from the center, that's fine and good. But what we are saying that the states on their own should actually be more proactive, effective in addressing the issues that they have in their states. Are they also saying that the federal government must provide the palliatives for all their citizens? The answer is, should not be, it, should, it shouldn't be like that. The every state, as I said before, they have, they have budgets. They should have a register of people who are not doing well, people who can be supported. And all these things should actually have been, will have been planned. Remember that we had Ebola some years back. So the question is, what, have, what did we learn from Ebola? If we have been reactive like this across the states in Nigeria, it means that we didn't really learn much from Ebola. So if we learned, then we, then we should have data for all these kind of issues. We should have a strategy to address some of these issues, not for them to have a meeting and say, we now need money from the federal government, or we don't have money and all that. And another question that we're supposed to ask is, what are they really doing with the revenues that they're, they're generating and the one that they can actually generate in terms of the potential to generate a month revenue. They shouldn't really be, and the reason for all this, not only from, not only Northern governors, but across the states, is that there is too much reliance on the center from our states. So they can't do anything until, until there is fact distribution. They can't really address certain things until you get money from the federal government. And when there is anything like this happens, the all eyes will be on federal government. As if to say that the states do not exist, as if to say that local government do not exist, as I said before, the summary of this is that we need responsible leadership and shared responsibility in Nigeria. Now, let's take a bit with what you're just saying now, because you've seen a lot of pressure on the center since we started fighting this COVID-19 pandemic in terms of federal government should support the poor and vulnerable with palliatives. But we are not, even as a nation, even as a people, we are not, our attention has not even gone to our states that states should also take responsibility for those living in their states. The federal government has, I think, 11 million individuals. The president did say that he was going to add 1 million to the 2.6 million households uh, uh, initially on, on the register, bringing it to 3.6 million. I've not really heard, or perhaps they are, and I don't know, and I'm surprised I will not know that kind of thing because I know some of those things happening in the financial sector. We've not heard the governors coming out to say that, okay, out of the money of the state, I'm marking, let's say, 5 billion, 10 billion naira out of it to provide as palliatives, even if it's 5,000 naira to their citizens. So it will also help cushion the effect 
of this COVID-19 pandemic and also help the federal government, just like you said in your article, it's about responsibility, it's about shared responsibility. Shouldn't we put I, more pressure on these governors at this time? I, I think that if we remove the mortalities caused by coronavirus, I think that it is actually, it provides an opportunity for Nigeria to really sit down and rethink so many things. As I said earlier on, there has been too much reliance on the federal government by the states. So it has made most of our governors, most of our local government chairmen, not to be innovative, strategic in their thinking, and having a clear vision of what they want to do with their states. So this coronavirus also provides opportunity for us to rethink, rethink the structure of governance in Nigeria. In terms of, if anything happens, should we continue like this? I read what the CBN um, uh, um, published. We asked, uh, we asked how they will address the issue. But the question we are supposed to ask is, where are the states in this publication? Where are the local governments in this publication? Will it everything be done by the federal government? And also, are they the responsibilities of the central bank? So will the central bank be both monetary policy and physical policy, and even supply side policy, in terms of everything that they're trying to do. They are commendable, but it, they all bring the issue in terms of the structure of governance in Nigeria. There is a need to rethink this continuous reliance on FAC, on federal allocation and all that. And all. Our governors should be told the truth that they need to be more innovative, think strategic in their thinking, and see how they can really develop their state. There is no state in Nigeria, I've argued many times, there is no state in Nigeria that cannot that is not viable. Let me just put something, in 2017, Indonesia generated about 12.6 billion from oil, oil and gas. But interestingly, they also got 18.4 billion from, palm from, palm oil. Oil, yeah. from palm oil. So the question you ask then is, if this is possible, why is it that our states are not even thinking about this thing? I was reading a report with regards to to uh, agriculture in Nigeria. So the question that we're supposed to be asking ag again is, how do we even come out from this COVID-19? Of course, you saw what IMF is uh, said, ADB and World Bank and other institutions are clearly saying that it's going to be a rough road. So the question we're supposed to be asking is, what are the short-term impacts, long, medium-term impacts, and long-term impacts of coronavirus? And then, what are the strategies that we're going to use for this short-term? medium term and long term. So I was reading a report. Let me just explain this. Cassava alone in Nigeria, just the opportunity in cassava is about 450 billion naira a year. I mean, I'm talking about only Gary production. So the question then is, is it not possible for us to say, as we are moving into uh, farming season, our state governors should sit back and say, how do we cushion this effect? They're already asking for the federal government to stop uh, their, their, their debts and all that. That's fine. But in the long term, we want to see a governor that will say, in the next two years, three years, I will not depend on the federal government for any revenue. And it is possible. So in the short term, as this is going to have an effect on us, what are they going to do to ensure that in the next three months, in the next four months, that the money they're going to generate from agriculture will be enough to cushion the impacts of reduction of fact allocation. So we look at maize that takes about three months and look at other agricultural products. Is it not possible for them to sit back and say, okay, let's focus on maize, let's focus on soya beans, let's focus on this and all that and really make sure that there's connection with the federal government, ensure proper security in their different states to enable farmers, support farmers, incentivize them to, to go into farming so that in the next six months time, we'll be exporting some of these products and we'll make enough revenue to reduce the impact of COVID-19 on, on, on Nigeria and on the states. Dr. Franklin, the issue now is, from what you're saying, even in terms of export, what perhaps these governors and our leaders haven't thought through is that COVID-19 uh, pandemic may just reset globalization. Uh, we see what is happening, especially in America. President Donald Trump said yesterday that he's not giving mon money again to WHO. So what COVID-19 may actually do in the short to medium term is that isolo uh, isolationist behavior. So yeah. even 
we may not even have anything to export because since you're talking about food, let's feed ourselves here. In India, for example, they've shot everything. Their medicines, they are not exporting to anybody anymore. All their food they are consuming, all their medicines they are consuming. Then for a nation like Nigeria, we haven't seen that kind of thought through process to say, guys, we are in a serious quagmire. We need to feed ourselves. We need to produce for ourselves. And nobody's thinking. The governors that are supposed to be thinking now are thinking something else. And I'm wondering where they, where they come from. Because really, we really need to put, um, open their eyes to see it in case they are not seeing it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So with what you're saying, for example, taking maize, for example, who says maize cannot be planted in the next three months? We see what's happening. Prices of food have gone up. Why? Because of so much demand, as it were. And the supply is, is, is not as much as it is there. So should we, how should we begin now to tweak innovation? Tweak inno innovation. I know what I'm saying. Tweak it. Because to them, they may think <laughs> they're a bit innovative. How do we begin to think tweak innovation to get I, I the like end result? Because to me, yeah. it's not even a laughing matter, really. I shouldn't be laughing through this thing because it's a serious matter. It's not a laughing matter, but of course, we are living in a very uh, 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 challenging times. So even with the uh, challenges, it's still good to, to, to be at peace and smile a little bit. So with regards to remember that when we had recession in 2016, a friend said that a recession ended too quickly. So, and that's true because after the recession, we started sharing money again and people relaxed. So what, I, what we are supposed to, as I said earlier or earlier on, without the mortalities and people dying and all that and all that, I think COVID-19 provides a big opportunity for us to really think. It's also very good that people, we can't travel now. So all of us are in Nigeria. So that means that all of us, we have to sit back and think properly in terms of our health sector, infrastructure, agriculture, and rethink the whole country. As I earlier said, it is time for even the governors and the federal government to really sit back and say, can we really develop Nigeria with the current structure that we have? Is it not better for us to look at certain things and say, are there things that the federal government can focus on and the state should focus on? As I earlier argued in many, in, in many of my articles, I've said many times that it is fundamental for us to look at the exclusive list and the concurrent list. And so that we can know exactly what the states are supposed to do, what the parliament is supposed to do, and what the government is supposed to do. So I totally agree with you that it is time for our governors, our senators, local government chairman, to really sit back, and the private sector as well, to say, how do we make Nigeria a better place? Because as you said, globalization, there will be impact on globalization. So the dependence or reliance on imports on, for so many things might not be there. So you can see what India has done. You can see what Germany has done. You can see, I mean, every, every country seems to be protecting their own citizens. So the question is, how do we ensure that we do that in the short term, medium term, and long term? Even if COVID-19 ends, there is no guarantee that another pandemic or another crisis will not uh, start or emerge. So the question is, how are we prepared in terms of from planning ourselves, we are supposed to do so many scenarios and say, how do we manage all these issues and ensure that Nigeria remains sustainable in terms of growth and development? Mm. Uh, uh, okay, what is the role of the National Assembly in all of this? Because you said earlier that we need to rethink, bringing in the senators, the House of Rep members in all of, uh, in all of this was on the exclusive list, was on the concurrent list. I, are you thinking perhaps by any means that this COVID-19 pandemic will really force us to sit down and do the hard work which, which we've been shying away from doing, which we've been pretending has not been happening, that Nigeria has just been good? Uh, why on the basis of the false price of oil? Let, I put it that way, false, in terms of if oil moves to like $60 tomorrow, $70, all this thing we are saying will go back to square one again. You understand what I mean? So. I, okay, that's why I say that everybody, we need to be on, we need to have a round table. And the senators and the National, of National Assembly, of course, they are the, is a very important aspect of government. So remember also, I, I'm not, about $17 trillion 
of that they are part of the global investment fund and negative interest. The question then is, if people are moving money out of Nigeria, Nigeria is still a very interesting place to invest. So the question we are supposed to ask is, what do we do to ensure that this global investment fund, about 17 or 15 trillion dollars, that are any negative interest find their way to Nigeria? And there are three things that must be addressed. One is rule of law, regulatory quality, and government effectiveness. Very, very important. And these are the, the areas that the National Assembly will come in. So it's, and also, I also said about the issue of, um, of, uh, um, of um, uh, exclusive lists and concurrent lists. So that the state government will now will not have really excuses to say that this one belongs to federal government. A federal government will not say this one belongs to the state. It has to be clear. So there are so many things that if we have people who are really innovative and thinking, some of these issues will not come up. I've mentioned earlier on what Netherlands makes from Kutato. They make about almost $2 billion. Uh, Germany makes about four point something billion from exporting pork meat. I'm talking about just pork meat. Spain makes about $4 billion. Denmark about $2.6 billion. Canada about $2.4 billion. Are we saying that a state government, even a, a senatorial zone, cannot just focus and say this is what we want to achieve? So why I say that National Assembly needs to come on board is that they need to help us to make the appropriate laws. Doctor, let me butt in here. Why do you think that we are not getting leaders that are thinking this way? Because these are, these are facts that are known. You can see it. There are examples all over the world, isn't it? Is it also because of the leadership process, selection process? Let me put it that way. That we also need to come back to the table to interrogate. Because just like we said earlier on, and I'm looking at the uh, governor's paper, central bank governor's paper. He did say, and let me quote, a 27 page document on page 11. He said, countries may continue to look inwards and globalization as we know it today may be dead for a generation. That's in 100 years time. I and you may not be here in 100 years time. And we we'll still be reaping from what is happening right now. So what is impeding us from having leaders that are thinking this way? I think that what some of the factors impeding us include one, the structure of governance in Nigeria. Second, the leadership recruitment process. Let me, and other factors, but let me talk about the structure of governance. So you, you are a governor. I remember a friend saying that, <laughs> a governor said that in a, every month, imagine if you're a governor and in a month you receive 20 billion without doing anything, every four weeks. Of course, your thinking capability, even you will reduce. Because you are not working, you are not doing anything, and you make 20 billion every month. And nobody will even ask you questions because people don't even know where the money and how the money gets to the states. So if we restructure, and re I have argued many times that it is time for us to sit back and say, can we really continue like this? And the answer is no. There is a serious social capital deficit in Nigeria. So I'm going to mean social capital, I'm talking about social trust. And that makes it very difficult for people to believe, accept, support what the federal government is doing. Because it's always believed that if the person is from a particular side, he will definitely favor the, his, his people as the case may be. So a typical example is when um, Soludo was in consolidation. Some people argued that he was pursuing a, an agenda for southern Nigeria. When Sanusi became the governor, so people are now alleged that he was trying to retaliate what the Southern Soludo did to the Bantu Sotoyan of Nigeria. So this kind of narratives will not help us at all. So what we are supposed to do is to say, how do we rethink the structure of governance of this country? And say, some, people, some places, you are very good in this. We need to identify the competitive advantages of the different regions and the different states of Nigeria and say, let's focus on this particular aspect. But we need to do it by restructuring the country. If we restructure the con inter economic restructuring, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm even focusing on. Mm. And say, okay, let's remember that when uh, OAU was built, in part of Nigeria and Soka, in part of Ibadan, uh, ABU, Zaria, was purely based on when we had regional governments. So we need to uh, dilute the powers at the center and see how we can devolve powers to the states and to the local governments. And now increase the social trust that we have in Nigeria by making sure that our governments are accountable and ensuring that they are also responsible in terms of what they will do. So by the time you devolve powers, 
you now have you now give the people more opportunity to actually question what is going on because there will be no money to be shared and when there is no money to be shared there will be crisis and when there is crisis there will be a resolution in terms of how do we manage this crisis that will now bring accountability transparency and good leadership in nigeria but a situation where all you need to do is to just corner, corner your own senatorial zone and become a senator and go to abuja the money that you spend in abuja your senatorial zone they don't contribute. They don't really know how, how, how you get the money. And so they don't really have that, that, that ownership or responsibility to really question you very well. But by the time there is no money, we'll all sit back and start asking ourselves, how do we make the country a better place? Mm. I'm, I'm being forced to go further and further, but it's almost 12 now. So we have to end this, this discussion very soon in the next few minutes. Because from what you're saying now, the next question is, isn't it deliberate by our leaders to maintain status quo to the disadvantage of the rest of the people? I hope you understand what I mean in terms of let's it just be same old, same old, so that's in from the system. Not knowing, just like what Atedo Petersai told me yesterday on the show, the founder of Stambik uh, IBTC Bank PLC, he said that the way it is going, the poor will infect the rich if the rich don't do what is needed. So at the end of the day, it may just be a vicious cycle. You would think that you are enjoying yourselves. At least COVID has shown us everybody's here. We all stay here. You are not going to anywhere. So develop your hospitals, develop your health system, develop the economy so that we can all benefit. As we move towards the end of the program, let's talk about security, which is very, very essential. And um, in the midst of what the government is doing to fight COVID-19 and all of that, the security aspect has to be part of it because I've not also seen a holistic approach by the whole of the government. You understand what I'm saying? The federal government is doing the states are on their own. CBN is doing their own. A fiscal response, uh, stim fiscal stimulation committee, economic sustainability committee, uh, economic advisory council, COVID-19 response. Come on. Where is the... Do you understand what I'm saying? Then the security I, of it. Part of I it. Understand, I understand everything you're saying. And that's why, I, if you look at, there is a coordination problem in Nigeria. And that coordination problem, and so that has led to multiplicity of people, of different um, institutions, associations, platforms, to do something. So, from my assessment, Nigeria is too big and too complex to be governed by a powerful central government or federal government. There is need to devolve powers so that the people, for, for example, Southwest, we know that this is what we're going to focus on. So for instance, they've launched a motorcycle and all that and all that. So what I'm trying to say, you need to reduce governance to this level. So if you talk about security, governors are the chief security officers of their states. However, they don't control the police. The police is controlled by the federal government. The federal government controls the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, and other security agencies. So that's the, 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 my view in terms of that there's need to rethink the structure of governance in Nigeria. So more, some of these things are prerequisites that will enable effective governance and effective coordination. So for instance, if you say, okay, the certain, some of these factors are now localized in regions or states, and they take full control of it. There will be more accountability, there will be more effectiveness, there will be more responsibility. But when you, governors can actually say it's from the IG, it's from the president, you have to get a, a permission from the president to do certain things. It makes the whole thing a bit, a bit uh, wobbly. So Senator will do their own, this one will do their own, this one will do their own. This one. There is no coordination. And the reason why there is no coordination is because there is no trust. And that trust is, because, is beyond what we can discuss within the few minutes that is, that is remaining, because of the way Nigeria was formed, because of the way we've been governed, and all those factors. There's something that they call part dependence. Part dependence means that if you are born in a poor place like Ajegunle, you definitely, it will be difficult for you to actually be very, very successful. If you're not a footballer or a, a, musician. a, a musician, as the case may be, you'll definitely be in one, one direction. So the, what, the path that we've passed as a country has not really enabled us to create the requisite social capital platform that will enable sustainable development of the country. And okay. that is why even, even genuine efforts are being thwarted or will not be supported by the different components of the country to achieve success. Okay, Doctor, just as we go, there are a few comments coming in on social media. On Twitter, Chris is saying some governors are trying to politicize COVID-19 pandemic so that they will get free money from the federal government. 
Honestly, Nigerian has a, Nigeria has a problem of leadership. Sam Diala says all state governors are thinking of all money. All eyes are on free, cheap, and easy all money. It is when all money finishes that we will think. All prices are around 30, uh, 30 something US dollars today. I think about two, three weeks ago, it fell below $20. Someone said, I hope it will even fall for now so that we will think. <laughs> All right, uh, Chris says, uh, Dr. Frank, it is impossible for Nigeria to have responsible leaders due to high rate of corruption. Uh, we don't have time to look into all of that. Now, Nolly Craft says, good morning, Nancy. Regarding this COVID-19 pandemic, the sub-governments should be firing on all cylinders the, the time to enable them to be on top of the game over such crises, such as testing, palliatives, lockdown recoveries. As people are locked down, palliatives should go round. Um, why Captain Mike Derry says, those that say they have given money. Why can't we see their list? Hunger is killing us here in my area. No food, no money. Okay, Matthew says, organized lockdown, as you call it, can only be obtainable in an organized society of which Nigeria is not one. Copy and paste policies have never worked for us, but our leaders wouldn't learn. Why can't Nigeria develop their own models, policies that capture our peculiarities? So many comments coming through. That is like, Nigeria is our own policies and measures. Doctor, Thank you for joining me. It's almost 12 p.m. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, continue to keep safe. Thank you for having me, and thank you again. All right. Thank you. That's the much we can take with uh, Dr. Franklin Ngu. Uh, he's an economist as well as an associate professor with the Lagos Business School.